morning everyone. Today I'm going to talk to you about the three most important things you need to systemize a business. So it's a, a wonderfully wet Wednesday morning. This is why I'm grateful for this, uh, this blog uh, and my running challenge of running every day for 30, uh, 365 days uh, for, me for a whole year. Pure and simply because yesterday's topic on running was about running goals and how you hold yourself accountable. But if I didn't have this vlog to do today, looking out the window this morning, for the running challenge, I'd have probably thought, oh, you know what, I'll give it a rest today. It's actually hammer it down. I know you can't see it, probably on the camera, but it's that really fine, kind of misty rain, which is really kind of heavy, but really light at the same time. It's quite a, an actually enjoyable run because it's, um, Temperature is about 13 degrees, so it's, 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 quite, it's actually you know, not too cold at all, and uh, it's quite refreshing. <laughs> so uh, thank you for getting me to, out to run today. Um, okay, so today, obviously Wednesdays I talk about all things systems and outsourcing. My previous three years was working or co-owning the company Systems and Outsourcing. I uh, fully systemized my property-based business to the extent of where I was working 60 hours plus a week. Well, I got down to working less than six hours a week. Sorry, less than six hours a month. I was doing 60 hours a, a week. I got down to less than six hours a month running that same business in less than six months. So uh, I've got a fairly good foundation knowledge of this topic. And hopefully this is an area of expertise that I'll be able to add a lot of value to any of you with, uh, with businesses out there. So the three things you need to systemize a business. We'll start with... Uh, with number one, and this is a pretty obvious one, is uh, is um, systems and processes. Now, that might sound specifically vague, and, and everyone goes, oh yeah, I know we need systems and outsourcing. So it's not outsourcing, systems and processes. However, they don't often quite realize that they pretty much have all of them already. But more often than not, it's the business owner that has all of that information. They know how their business works. I mean, nobody knows your business better than you do as the owner. You built it, you have the vision for it, you have the direction for it, you lead it. You know all the intricacies of that business if you've built it from scratch. And um, you know how things should be done or how you want things to be done. Now they may not be done in the way you want them at this moment in time, but you certainly know, or you have a really good idea of how you'd like them to work, or you know, you know, you don't know how they're actually going to do, how it's actually going to work, but you know what you'd like the end result to be. So I know that was quite a, a waffly response, but the also, bottom line is, as a business owner, you know what you want from your business and you know what you want your business to do to get, it, to get you there. So um, that's really key. The issue is, nine times, maybe nine and a half times out of ten, the business owner has retained all of this super valuable IP for your business in their head which clearly is intangible and clearly it's that uh, you can't just give that information to the rest of your team or for anybody new that comes into your business to work. You just can't do that. So the first thing is, is the, is the, is the process of extracting that information from my head and getting it into some form of tangible form. Now, um, I'll go into a lot more detail on how you do this in, uh, in other videos. However, just to give you a very simplified way of doing so, is use the power of video. Now, uh, the days of standard operating procedures, operation manuals still exist. However, the way they are delivered has changed dramatically. I mean, 20 years ago, an operations manual or standard operating procedure would be a text document. You, you know, questionably, there might be the use of the odd picture, but more often than not, it'd just be a text document with a list of rules what you do here, what you do there, checklists, all that type of stuff, which is great as a starting point. However, if you've, if you've tried this before in the past, where you've uh, passed over some written instructions to somebody or checklist to somebody, and the res result has been substandard to what you expected. And the first thing we do as, a, as entrepreneurs, normally until you change the way you're thinking, is you point the finger, oh, why didn't you do that right? And it's a kind of a blame mentality. In actual fact, the blame lies with you. And the reason it does is because 
you know, those instructions were not clear or concise enough to allow that individual to complete the task to the required standard. So look at your instructions, look at how you delegate rather than pointing the finger. So that's a really, really important point there. So roll on 20 years and the use of video communication is born. And you know, I said this often, that people say a picture said a thousand words. Well, a video would say a bit of a million then, because if I gave someone a video of any of the processes in my business and don't misinterpret that, oh, well, that's only useful if you're on a computer because you can call your screen. We all have smart devices in our pockets these days that are just as capable of producing equally high quality video when you're out in the field. So the same principle applies. In video, what you're doing, and you just narrate yourself doing it in a very structured fashion. It doesn't have to be super structured. There's a couple of checks you need to follow when recording a video, and I'll go into these in more detail in, a, in another, another call. We, go del we delve deep on, um, on video recordings. But um, use video. Just record what you do. And do you know what? The days of, of writing operations manuals, I mean, I've been there, done this multiple times over, and failed at it so many times. You write an operations manual for a relatively menial task in your business. You can be sitting there for a couple of hours, two, three hours, writing something. And when you get your, your result as being substandard, it's, it's heartbreaking. You know, you put all that effort in, and then you realize that that's one task of probably a couple of hundred in your business that you have to write these manuals for. And it's like, talk about standing at the bottom of Mount Everest, and you've got no motivation to continue with it because the results from what you have done have been substandard. So the key thing is, is those days of two to three hours, it's gone. You're already doing the work at this moment in time. So just get this into your mind. It takes two to five minutes on average to record a video of you doing something. It takes two to five minutes slightly longer than it would take you to do the task yourself when you record yourself doing it. And two to five minutes is nothing. Everybody can find that time. And the key benefit here is once you've done it, technically you never have to do that task again. Because you've got it recorded, you've got the IP, you can pass it over to somebody else, somebody else can copy what you've done on that, on that video. And it's uh, super, super easy to do that for other people. Now, obviously, you might re-record the video multiple times. And the other thing I want to say about video, it doesn't have to be perfect. These are internal training videos. Even if you make a mistake or you stutter, you can just say, sorry, please ignore that bit, then carry on again. You know, highly likely in the future, these uh, processes will be updated and they'll be re-recorded by people anyway. So bear that in mind. Okay, so that's number one. Most important thing you need is systems and processes. The good news is, is that pretty much all of you will have these already in place, just unfortunately in your head. And it's the process of extracting that information and getting it into tangible format. Number two is people. Now, uh, again, a lot of people shy away from bringing in people. People equal problems, you know, all the management, all the HR, all the hassles. And, you know, I have a fair amount of experience in, in recruiting people. Um, I've had, I've probably had maybe 20 or so people work for me in the property business over the years. Uh, nine at the same time, at any one point in time. I currently now have four working in that business at, at the same time uh, without me. And uh, that's just through the, through the process of streamlining my efficiencies and, and all that sort of things. Um, so I know I've had people I've recruited from the UK, I've had people that I've recruited from the Philippines, from, from India, from Pakistan, from, from places all over the world. And you know, there are cultural differences. 100%. However, the one thing, the one common denominator is, is you need people. No matter where they're from, obviously there is a, a cost element that comes into the play when you're starting out. And you know, the cost of UK resource is, is uh, often four times as high as in places like the Philippines. Um, that's not to say I'm promoting slave labour or anything here. You know, the cost of living in the Philippines is four times less than it is in the UK, or there they're about. So, it's all relative. You're paying people in relation to their economy and their uh, current climate. So, um, and it's down to you to negotiate a fair deal with whoever you're bringing in. So it's a win-win scenario. Um, we'll talk about that again in another another episode. But the key thing here is not unethical what we do. And um, the, the other thing is with people is that people say, "Oh, I don't need people. I just use automation." Automation can greatly enhance your efficiency levels and reduce the need for the number of people, or the number of hours that people are working in the business, but it will never replace the need for people. There's no way you, know, you can do that. There's no way you can get a robot 
but I mean, there might be a super tech wizards that probably could have a go at it, but to, 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 the, to the average entrepreneur or business owner, no way could you set up a fully automated business. Um, even if you do, and it's fully automated, you'll be the one person in that business. So you still have to monitor it and keep on top of it to make sure it works. So you're still a person in that business. And like I say, it's, it, you can't operate without people. So people are super, super important. And what I normally say is that when you look at the, we'll talk about building teams more detailed in, a, in another episode, but in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, you need to, you, know, you want to aim to get to four people in your business because there's, they're all very different types of roles. The four main functions of a business. There are more, you can break them down, but at a super high level, you've got the leader or the key person of influence. The person who is um, who leads the business, directs the business. You know, that's a um, very different skill set. That's the entrepreneur's role. Okay, very, very different role to somebody who's going to do accounts, for example. So that's role one is the is the, the business leader or the KPI, the visionary. Um, role number two is sales and marketing. This is a <coughs> quite a, you know, you need to be very organized. You need to understand sales and marketing. You know, if you're in sales, it requires a certain type of character who can personality traits to convert closing, whether it's doing it by text or over the phone. Marketing can often be quite creative. So you need somebody who's got a creative mindset, especially if it's something like design and that side of things and brand and those sort of things. So again, very different type of person. Operations, the person who, the glue of the business, holds everything together, make sure everything's happening. Make sure your business delivers on what it's expected to deliver. So the proven process of your business, make sure that's working. That's super, that's management material. That's um, managing people possibly. That's um, super organization skills required. Great communication. You know, that's a, a management position. Ultimately, I'm making sure that that stuff kind of happens. And there might be people that kind of come in under that person to do comms, to do onboarding, logistics, product development, all that stuff. But that main person in the operations position needs to have, you need to have those type of traits. Then you've got finance and admin. It's a very analytical, detailed uh, process, you know, detailed role. So you need somebody who's, who's more analytical, who's, no, who's often quite number, you know, numerically blessed or good with spreadsheets. Attention to detail has to be exceptional here. So it's, um, it's a completely different type of person to sales and marketing, almost the opposite. So I'm just going past someone. So it's, um, they're all three different, all different roles. And I've tried putting people in, in the same seat. Sorry, putting the one person in two seats. And it doesn't work. I've tried it numerous times to try and cut. So when you start building a team, the first, the first person I bring in, first and foremost, at stage one, is your, I call this a, a VPA, virtual personal assistant. Okay, so it's affordable, you can bring someone in, and they're eventually going to move into the operations role or lead. Well, they may move into the finance and admin, but it, they'll move into one of those positions. But first of all, you bring those in whilst your business is small. And you're then looking at the next two people that are going to fulfill sales and marketing and finance and admin. So, um, and obviously you're going to stay in the role of that. But you grow into, into kind of levels of four. And I'll talk to you about this and the reasons why it's based on the reasons that armies build their kind of regiments or departments in, 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 in multipliers of four. So we'll go into detail on that in another, another episode. So people you need. If you want a systemized business, if it's just you, it's never going to be systemized. Even if you've automated it as much as you possibly can, you will still be involved in that business. Therefore, in my definition, it will not be a systemized business. So number three, and this is something that Super, super important, but so many people overcomplicate and get so wrong. Data or numbers. Okay, to systemize a business and to step out, you have to approach the strategy of management by numbers. And if you do not have data for all areas of your business, you'll never be able to manage your business from afar by numbers. You don't want to be micromanaging people, you want to be micromanaging KPIs or metrics. And you don't want less is more in a section. So many people will have data and reports coming in from all ends of the business. But if you look at that, that report, and you can't just glance at it and understand exactly what's happening in your business, then there's too much data in there. 
doesn't serve the purpose. Now, there's an analogy I've used before with my, uh, with my previous coaching clients about you know, how data and how metrics and how reporting can, can occur. And it was to do with a, a, a steel welding manufacturing operation. I think it was based in the US somewhere. And you know, this is an entrepreneur business owner who was constantly scrutinizing data, how many sales, how much manufacturing they've done, all this type of stuff. And it was just, he was just not natural numbers. And what it came down to is he would sit in his office and look out the manufacturing plant and see all of his workers welding away. And what would currently happen is the welder would go and walk over to the supply, uh, the supply cupboard, and get the, um, get the um, materials. They'd bring it back to the, to the welding station. They'd complete the weld. Then when they finished the weld, they would move that, that, um, that finished product to logistics or, or out for delivery or to dispatch, and then somebody else would take it and would, would, would uh, deliver it. So um, what he found out was the money was made in the amount of welding that was done in his business. So what he did, he thought, you know what? The more those blue lights are showing in my, man, in my, in my factory, factory warehouse, the more money I'm making. But the problem was, it was only 30% of the time these blue lights were on because they were picking up the raw material and carrying it over to dispatch. So what he did, he brought in some kind of labourers or runners and the actual welder would just stay on the welding station with the, with the specialist skill set and somebody else would bring the material to him and somebody else would take the finished product out to dispatch and then his simple metric was he would glance out and judge by how much the blue light was showing in his, in his, in his manufacturing plant. It's that simple. That was as much of the metric as he needed to know whether his decision was performing well or not. Now, not, you know, that's a truly simplified, sorry, simplified model. And you'll probably need maybe one to three metrics in each of your high level departments as a minimum. Um, and possibly more depending on your goals. But ultimately, we'll come into goal planning and, and, and you know, my use of a, a strategy called the 12-week year, where you uh, set goals for 90 days. Ratcheted back from your one year plan, ratcheted back from your five year plan, ratcheted back from your end game. You know, so you're reverse engineering your goals. But the, the key thing here is, is that you may have kind of you know, one or two goals per department. So you might have somewhere in the region of seven issues, probably the maximum you want to kind of be having in your business at any given point in time. Three to seven is kind of optimal. And um, <coughs> you have a match of metric for each of those goals that's reported on a daily basis. That then allows you to see, without having to micromanage people, the progress that you're making towards that, that, that given target. And if you're, you know, if it's not progressing or slowing, then there's a problem. You have to jump in, and you need to talk to whoever's in charge and work out solutions. And again, it's not blame mentality. Work in a democracy, not a dictatorship, and work together with people so that they can. Sorry, I'm just going past the man. Thank you. So work in a democracy and work together. Work in collaboration, it's far more motivational, where people who don't fear you, but have, know that you, they've got, you've got, they've got your support to help them if they're having problems. Solve it together, try something else. The beauty of it is, you're always measuring the success of the little tweaks and the changes you make. So I've gone fairly deep on this stuff already, and I wanted to keep this high level. So I'm going to leave it there, but to summarise, to systemise the business, the three most important things you need. Number one, systems and processes. Good news is that 95% of business owners already have these, but the downside is it's in their head. Intangible, you need to extract it into a tangible format. My recommendation is use video to enable you to do that. Very quick and easy to do, and very easy for people to follow. Number two is people. Start with one, then get to four. I'll talk to you about how you build from there, further down the line. But um, four is an optimal number. Start with one person. You cannot run a business. In its entirety without, entirety without people. So don't think that you can. Challenge me if you think otherwise, because if you can, I'd love to know about it. Um, and number three is data. And 